Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome to our A to J Author Advanced User Forum. I'm Jessica Bolak, the Program Coordinator here at CAJT. Um, and today is just a quick reminder before we get started that I'm actually going to unmute everyone. So this is different than how we usually run these. Um, if you need to mute yourself, you can, but as soon as I get to the next screen, I'm going to unmute everyone. We really want um, your input today, so I would like to facilitate kind of a group discussion. If you don't have a microphone, you can put your questions in the comments in the question box, and then I can read them to the group. If you're calling in today by phone, make sure to enter your audio pin so that you can be heard. And the session is being recorded and might be posted on a2jauthor.org. Okay, so I'm unmuting everyone right now. Um, the agenda today is A to J Author needs you. Um, we are in the construction and design phases of A to J Author 5, and we need your input. So things to think about, length of questions, how often you're using Learn Mores, how often pop-ups and hyperlinks are used, how you use video, audio, and graphics, any plans for foreign language A to Js, um, how you're using or how often you're using advanced conditions, repeat loops, and branching, uh, thinking about our avatar, the road to the courthouse, and potentially different looks for different kinds of guided interviews. So the first thing on the agenda, a little bit about where we are with A to J Author 5. So um, we've been working on it for a couple of months now, and we're finally at the, um, really in the design decision phase. So a lot of what we're deciding is going to be affected by how you guys are using um, A to J Author. And um, a lot of the decisions we make about where to place things, especially in the mobile version, um, it matters how you use it, how often you guys are using certain tools, that kind of thing. And on another note, we have um, another TIG for our Access to Justice Clinical Course Project, the A to J Clinic, which we launched this week. So that's good news for all of you in legal aid. You're about to have lots of law student resources um, for designing A to J's and actually doing the programming um, where you guys maybe don't have the time to do so. Um, if you're interested, the A to J um, clinical course is um, faculty get $5,000 for designing the course kit. We're also providing $3,000 for technical support. Um, and we have a November 15th deadline. So if you are um, have any connections within the legal aid, um, oh, sorry, within the law school um, area, please reach out to them and uh, let them know. And just a reminder, because you guys all are unmuted, if you're typing, please mute yourself. Thanks. Okay, so here's the first thing. A to J author, we need you. What is the average length of questions that you guys are looking at? Do you have short questions, or are you finding yourselves with longer questions? So I'm going to open it up. Um, anyone want to start the discussion? What are your average length of questions in your guided interviews? Anybody out there? I guess some people are still muted, so I'm unmuting everyone. Sorry about that. All right, everybody should be muted, if you're, or unmuted. If you're doing something else, please mute yourself. Okay, so what are the average length of questions that we're looking at? Well, this is Grace. Somewhere in between the two that we're looking at here. Okay. What, um, what do you mean? Like one paragraph? Do you find the scroll bar coming up? Um, no, I try to avoid the scroll bar, and um, I try to have real short paragraphs, so, you know, it might take um, half of the space on the, the right-hand example, but there would be a lot of white space in there because of short paragraphs, so there might be two paragraphs, one sentence each. Okay. Um, so that, that's good to know because the big thing in the mobile is that we already have to break up questions into multiple screens. Um, the question on the left would fit on one screen probably. Um, 
but if it gets any longer than that, it's kind of getting, um, it's getting a little out of control with how many we have to put through the screen. I think someone needs to mute themselves. Alright, so um, I see Bob that your hand is up. Okay, any, anyone else on the question link? This is Sheila. I'll just say that since the implementation of the, si the scroll bar on the right, mm -hmm. that actually reduced the amount of territory you had you to write that. because um, some of the questions that I had that did not need to scroll, somehow when there was a scroll bar put in it, even made the space smaller. So. Um, Yes, that's, yeah, that's odd. I don't think this, I mean, I shouldn't really say this, but I don't think the scroll bar really helped much. Okay. Because nobody scrolls. Okay. I don't want your question that long. Sheila, hang on one second. I'm going to mute everyone else so that um, we're getting the interference out of the way. So just one second. We'll unmute you. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so it changed the way um, it actually made it more difficult or... Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, no offense, but no, I don't no, think it really ahead. helped matters because uh, nobody scrolls. So if okay. your question was that long, it was, um, and, and what it also made difficult because if it wasn't just text, if it was choices, mm -hmm. and somebody saw three choices when actually if you scrolled there were five choices, it really interfered with actually getting accurate answers. So, um, okay. Anyway. Cool. It, no, th thank you. That's good to know. Um, it, um, it, it, we're just like trying to figure out what is out there. And so things, you know, that we see we made changes in the past, um, that definitely helps to know, you know, for the future iterations what it's going to look like. Okay, so I have a couple questions because of the feedback. I am going to keep everyone muted and then please do raise your hand um, instead of the open, uh, the open mic. So um, I see Mike's hand is raised, so I'll unmute Mike. You're unmuted. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Um, thank you for switching the forum. I, I, the format, I think it's going to work a lot better for us. Um, I, I generally try to aim for the, the length on the left. Um, the, the shorter, the better. I mean, I, I think we all try to follow that rule. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we have users who have you know, sometimes very limited reading ability. We need to keep the questions as short and simple as possible. But sometimes it's inevitable that the structure of your interview becomes such that you have a lot of options. And I think Sheila was saying something uh, to this effect that you know, the scroll bar does give you the capability of you know, giving people a bunch of options up to nine since that's our limit. Um, and sometimes I do that out of necessity because I don't know, you know how many uh, different iterations of, uh, say, I've been working on child custody. You know, how many children are going to be involved here? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I start with branching questions that sometimes you know, get up to, to nine options. So the scroll bar is really helpful in that respect, except that I do feel like sometimes I don't know if users are actually going to scroll. Uh, I have to add text to tell them, you know, the, you know these, these are the nine kids that, that you have talked about right. so that they know that there's probably more than just the two that are displayed uh, before they start scrolling. So if there's some way to make, I don't know, to make the scroll bar more pronounced or to build in some sort of direction so that users know that there's more text, uh, but without sacrificing the real estate that we have available to, to put in text. It, it's a real difficult balancing act, I know, but I just I, I kind of share that view that it, it's so subtle that we may have a lot of instances where people just get to the end of that text and think they're done. Um, right. and, and like I said, I really try to avoid such a long amount of text, but Sometimes with multiple options, it's it's, ne it's necessary to have that, um, and you have to somehow make sure that people know that there's more than just the options that are displayed. Right, and so in in the mobile version, what we're thinking of is kind of um, a swipe. So um, John Mayer has been, you know, he talked about it in past conferences, and he's been kind of showing us a little bit um, here on the A to J team, um, and it would it, we, there wouldn't be a scroll bar obviously in the mobile version because um, the scroll, it just gets a little out of control. It's more, for longer questions, it's easier to do swipe across. It's more of a natural um, motion in mobile, at least. So that might right. help 
they can't, basically they can't escape having to read the whole thing um, because they have to keep yeah. swiping to get to either the yes, no, or the continue, or the options, or whatever. So um, that might that might kind of diffuse that a little bit, but it's something to think about for the non-mobile version as well. Um, right. We always try and suggest shorter questions. I mean, that's kind of the point of A to J is to eliminate a lot of the heavy text, um, you know, and take it short, you know, short bursts at a time. So it's good to know. Um, I don't know how this okay. would go over, but I mean, what would people think about limiting the amount of text we can put in one of these boxes? To lock, we avoid that problem. To lock it down, like we put a character yeah. limit on it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that would go over very well, but it's just a thought. That's interesting. Yeah, we'll throw it out there to the group. So, what do you guys think about locking down um, the character count? So, I'm gonna mute you, Mike, and um, if you'd like to be unmuted, please raise your hand. Let's see. Okay, Claudia, I'm unmuting you right now. Claudia, you there? Yeah, we had a usability expert here at LHI over the summer, and she observed real users using real forms um, all over New York City. And the scroll bar, she said, is particularly bad mm -hmm. from a usability point of view. So she recommended that we encourage um, developers not to use them. Mm -hmm. Um, because a lot of people don't know how to scroll down unless, like Mike said, you put some text um, and maybe hopefully not in the interview because that's just going to make it longer, but some graphical way of showing people, okay, if you know you need to move down because a lot of times people miss the options mm -hmm. if there are buttons or, or things at the end to select. So from a usability point of view, the scroll bar is not recommended. Yeah, it seems in my talks with John that we're going to be, you know, not using the scroll bar, at least in the, in the main screen. There's, there's talk about potentially using it um, for another area, but in the main questions, it'll be swipes, like on the touch screen. Or um, someone asked if mobile meant touch screen. Um, we're kind of thinking of it that way because that's a lot of ways phones are moving, but it would still be um, accessible to phones that are not touch screens. You basically just have to click over um, instead of swiping. Um, okay, so I actually am going to mute you, Claudia, and Tony mentioned something about his are generally longer because he's using the citizenship works. So, Tony, I'm going to unmute you if you could explain a little bit um, about the longer questions um, and your reasoning for using longer questions instead of the shorter ones. Tony, are you there? Okay. Sorry, yes, I was muted. Um, no, it's so okay. for citizenship, yeah, so for citizenship works and on the Own the Dream website that the Immigration Advocates Network is um, developing, we have a lot of, you know, the introductory screens tend to be pretty long, um, mm -hmm. and certainly we could break those up a little more so that they're shorter, but then that increases the number of pages, so there's a trade-off. And then on the other end of that is when uh, when you're presenting a list, and I think this was re referenced earlier, when you're presenting a list of five options that they have to choose between, and each of those five options need, uh, you know, some sort of description about that option. So uh, the, the easiest example I can come up with is in naturalization. There's several categories you can apply under, but each mm -hmm. of those categories is complicated in the sense of which, what the criteria are for each of those. But the user needs to be able to see all five options to figure out which one to pick. So right. not having the ability to scroll and locking it down would really uh, dramatically impact our ability to display the options with sufficient detail so the user is making an informed decision. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is if you could, if there's documentation about what the approximate uh, number of characters are before you trigger a uh, scroll bar, that would help developers designing a way to avoid that scroll bar showing up without having it be found there. That's, yeah, that's an interesting point if we could figure out, yeah, we, I mean, I'm sure we can definitely figure out and let you guys know what the, the maximum is. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions or comments at least. Um, Dina said that in the old version of A to J, um, before I was around, we used to lock down um, the text to a certain length. It, that was before the scroll bar. And the scroll bar was actually an implementation um, to help, you know, like in your situation, Tony, where you just need more text to explain it to an end user. 
Um, so it seems like we're not big fans of the, the, the locking down the text, um, and it kind of just has to be a community standard that um, shorter questions are better. Okay, I'm going to mute you, Tony, again. Um, is there anything else you guys want to share about questions or question length before we move on? Um, raise your hand if you do. Um, okay, let me just see if there's any more questions in this. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next topic. If you know, if you want to come back to the questions at the question length at the end, we can. So the next one is learn more pop-ups and hyperlinks. So we're curious about how often you guys are generally using these. Um, specifically, how often are you using Learn Mores, how often are you using pop-ups, and how often are you using hyperlinks, um, either individually or combined. Um, again, a lot of our issues are coming up with the, um, the mobile version. And so this would, that little tiny screen doesn't have room for the text of the question and the Learn More to be displayed at the same time. So using a Learn More looks like it might take the end user away from the text screen, but then give them the option to come back once they learn, you know, can't read through the Learn More. So we're just curious about how often these are actually used. So I see Carolyn has her hand raised. I'm going to unmute you, Carolyn. Go ahead. Um, I raised my hand for the last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. I was just thinking, I, I joined late. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, but, I mean, on the last question, when Tony was talking about the, um, the options, I found that people really struggle with the scroll bar. And I'm afraid I use a few, my, a few of my questions. It's not the text, the introductory text. It's sometimes I have the answers get lost in the okay. scroll bar. You know, they don't know that they have other options to even answer because my, inter you know, my question is so long. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something to think about in terms of, of you know, of that. I was wondering if you could, which kind of contradicts what you're talking about here, but if you could have pop-ups for the options. Tony was saying when you give the options, there's so much text that goes along with the option, mm -hmm. whether you could have pop-ups for the options. But then, of course, you're going to come into this problem with the that you're talking about now. And I, I use these all the time, the learn mores and the links and the pop-ups. I mean, because to my mind, this is the whole learn more is what makes A to J, it's, you know, 50, 75 percent of the value is this right. whole, you know, in, what's it called? In just-in-time learning, yep. right? So I, I would hate to lose these. Oh, we're not. Don't worry. We're not. Oh. <laughs> we're not getting rid of them. We're just trying to figure out like how they're going to work on the mobile version. Whether they're going to be like a little, you know, a button that you have to click on the side that says "Learn More," or if it's just going to, um, and then it would be kind of displayed over the text, or if it would be like moving you to a different screen where you could come back to the text. It's this tiny little phone is really throwing a, a wrench in some of our plans. Because you have on your on the Android, you have those. Um, you know, it's one of the, I guess it's a hardware control, mm -hmm. you know, where you have that little, I guess it's like a back arrow, and mm -hmm. that, I would imagine that's what you would use. It would, I would think it would open a new window, but I still haven't figured out, is it sort of related to this, I still am having some users click on the blue link that take you to another website, mm -hmm. and they get kicked back to the beginning of the interview. Oh, that's a weird, weird That's one. horrible. Yeah. <laughs> That would be and so I disheartening. Don't know. I can't figure. I cannot figure that out. But you know, to me, that sort of fits in with this, but di but differently. You know. Um, right. Well, Mike but. just answered that that was a problem with um, Internet Explorer, but that's kicking them back um, or to the start. So even if they use other browsers, that, that shouldn't happen. Um, let me unmute Mike, and maybe can he can expand a little bit more on this. Mike, go ahead. You're unmuted. Hi. Actually, Claudia will probably have more to say about this, but um, I've actually run into this problem, and it appears to be an issue with the way that the pop-up locker works in Internet Explorer. Right. And, uh, and I don't know exactly what the ins and outs of it, but something about that and the way that it interacts with the server, um, that's why I think Claudia would probably be a bit in a better okay. position to answer this question. But, yeah, it doesn't happen if you're using other browsers. So the, the only option to avoid that altogether would be to tell someone you can't use IE, which I think we all know is a really bad idea. So, <laughs> right. yeah, I think ultimately we need to have this problem solved. 
because um, I've run into that a lot, and I actually went back and converted all of my my external links to text. And it's it's awful, it's clunky, but it's the only way because otherwise users are, are going to run into that exact right. problem. They get so out. you're not sending people to websites. To, yeah. So you're not sending people to websites at all. Well, I'm giving them links, and, and I'm just counting on them to copy and paste, which I know is probably not happening. Uh, oh, so they can't, but they can't click from within the interview to a website. Correct. Oh, Correct. right, gotcha. I see. Yeah, it's a terrible solution, but to my mind, yeah. it's the only way to keep the links in there without adding right. a whole bunch of text at the beginning that will probably get lost in the shuffle anyway. So, yeah, it's, well, it's worse to get them sent back to the beginning of the interview. Exactly, it's horrible. <laughs> it, to me, it's a, yeah. it's a catastrophe if that happens. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. that's for sure. So maybe in the at least in the mobile version, it might it might be easier because in your you know at least on my um, Android, I can have multiple windows open, kind of running in the background. Um, it has to kind of it, we would just have to make it open in a new window as opposed to opening kind of in the same window. So yeah. the trick there will be yeah the trick there is going to be getting people to go back to the interview, right? Hoping that they're they're savvy enough with their phones that they'll know that they can multitask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are this this phone is really bringing up a lot of re, not just the way we think about A to J's, but also like how people are using them, who the level of sophistication, and uh, hopefully as you know more people have touch screens and that kind of stuff, it gets a little bit easier. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, a little on that. I, I, my preference would be to do what a lot of apps are doing, and that's to have the web page open within the app. Mm -hmm. well, so you're not taking away from the app, and you have a direct path back to where you were. Okay. Well, we're, yeah, so ours is not going to be like a, an app that you would download, you know, from the iPhone store or the Android market. It's going to be just a mobile version of the website. So it does. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not going to be, you know, you won't have an A to J icon right now sitting on your, your home screen um, on your right. phone. But it will just be, you know, like as if you were viewing any other website through mobile. Do, do mobile phones use IE? Does it, like the, I mean. I'm sorry, what was that? Well. No, I think unless you're running Windows Phone, and I don't even know what version of the browser to use on Windows Phone, but as far as Android and iPhone go, no, they don't use IE. Uh, so, they, so, so at least you've got that problem solved for mobile phones. You wouldn't get sent right. back to the beginning. <laughs> That's like a bonus. That's like the one thing that's easier <laughs> in mobile. <laughs> that's good. Um, okay, so I'm seeing that in, I'm, I'm going to mute you guys again. Just let me know if you need anything. Um, I am seeing a lot of people saying that they're using pop-ups super common to use them, um, or learn more is, um, are more common than pop-ups, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Jeff. Go, go ahead. Yeah, my question is, um, Claudia, when you did user testing, um, did users actually use the learn more or the pop-ups? Because my limited experience of testing is that no, everybody's in a hurry and almost no one clicks on, on them. All right, Claudia, I'm going to unmute you to answer that question. So did Yang Ting find that people are using uh, Learn Mores? Claudia? Claudia? It depends on the side whether, because they're different. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, you know, LHI is being used in a lot of different um, scenarios. So it depends on the side whether there is in-person assistance or not. That I know that people use them a lot when they are just working on assisted, like in a self-help center that doesn't have staff or enough staff to help people out. So they are very helpful. Um, and people are, actually, I, people are actually the, clicking on them? Yeah, people use them. We Right now we don't have a way to go and keep track, you know, the, the A to J author in Flash right now to us is like a black box, so <laughs> we cannot really um, do an accounting of how many. But people do use them when they're on their own. Now, if they're in a self-help center where they have a law student or some support um, and they already kind of have gotten, let's say they have, they have learned about the substantive issue and they know where, what separate property is, and they don't need to look at a definition for that. Uh, depending on how literate they are, they may not need to use it. Um, on the hyperlink issue, that is of serious um, concern. 
it's an issue that has been raised, it's in our list of tickets to fix, and the issue is exactly like Mike said, it's an Internet Explorer issue as it overlaps with the hot dog server software. Um, so we have it on the queue um, to look at if there's, because it's not something we can fix. We may be able to do a workaround, but it's not in our power because it's IE and it's hot dog server software, which we don't write. Um, so on that, um, we're looking at various options, including um, hopefully doing a release of the next version of hot dogs, which may fix this issue, or we have a, a workaround that we are going to consider testing, etc., to see if we could release it. But it's not, it's not necessarily a simple issue. But people do use the hyperlinks a lot, you know, like it's here with the postal office, and sometimes to connect to um, a website. It could be a court website, it could be a housing rights website, or a shelter, or something like that. So the hyperlinks are used a lot too. Okay. Um, are there any? Thank you. Are there any other, I'm muting you guys again, sorry about that. Um, are there any other people that want to talk about using Learn More's pop-ups? Um, some suggestions that we've gotten is that to kind of make sure people are, are maybe seeing the information in, instead of putting it in a Learn More. Mike says that he, um, he uses the in-text pop-ups um, so that the user doesn't miss them off to the side of the screen. Um, but okay, so any, anything else on this? All right, so then the next area I'd like to talk about is how often are you using audio, video, and the images? Um, we, this is our little sample um, that we like to throw in for our A to J guided interviews here, um, the little squirrel, but um, so we, we envision them being used um, for the images, say, to show someone where to sign. For the audio, obviously, to help those with vision impaired or a language barrier, um, and then the video, uh, we've actually seen, I'm not sure who has it, so I don't want to um, miss give credit, but um, they're using it to describe how to serve someone. There's a little short video by, made by a judge or a clerk that discusses how you would go serve process um, for that particular case. So I'll open up the floor for um, video, images, audio, issues you're having with them, or how often you're using them, that kind of thing. So please just raise your hand and I will unmute you. And just on that topic, another issue that we sometimes see is that while these, what we think are awesome options are out there, that they're not used as often as we thought they might be used. So if you're not using audio, video, or images, why aren't you using them? Okay, so just raise your hand to be unmuted. Okay, so um, Mike, I'm going to, oh, Sheila, go ahead. You're unmuted. Uh, no, I was just responding. Um, I find the, we only use, we've done some audio, but only with one set of templates for a particular TIG grant. We don't mm -hmm. have time to do it. So that's, we don't use it often. We have, don't have the capability videos, but the images, I use quite a lot when I'm trying to get people to tell me things about their court documents. Okay. I use graphics as much as possible, so I'm just going to say that's when we would use the graphics a lot, and it seems to help. Okay. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing that, yeah, a lot of people, it's just too much time, there's not the proper equipment, um, so if you, have, if you guys have anything to add for that one, I'm going to unmute, or I'm going to mute you again, Sheila. And, um, Dina, if you're there, you mentioned that Illinois doesn't use um, audio. Why? Or audio or video? Dina, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I had my self muted. <laughs> um, I, it's, I mean, primarily it was an organization decision that doing audio, it takes 
a lot of time and um, effort to create audio for every single piece of text in some of our interviews, and it's a maintenance issue. I mean, as soon as you change one word in a sentence, you have to re-record that, um, and we all do updates all the time. Um, so it's just kind of something that for the cost and time investment, we don't think we would get enough benefit out of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense that it's, and we, we actually were just looking for A to J's with audio and video um, to use for a demo, and it, we found that it was surprisingly hard to find some of the, especially the ones with video, so we kind of were interested about why, and it makes sense that, um, that you just, it's too much effort to keep it up afterwards. Okay, um, I'm going to mute you again. Let's see. Bob, you're unmuted. Hi, this is Bob. Uh, the problem with video is that the files can get very big very fast, even for a short video, and mm -hmm. you can quickly exceed the limitation for LHI. Uh, I, did, I did an interview with a short video, and the video was 15 meg. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're, you can get kicked out then. Yeah. Okay. So that's the problem. I, you know, I, don't, I don't think video is going to take off for that reason. Okay. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay. It's a little hard to see these questions, so if you guys just want to um, just raise your hand, we can kind of get a group discussion going. So, Claudia, you're unmuted. On the this is Claudia on the online form use of A to J, the the video is not being used um, in mass, and people that I talk to are not planning to do video. Um, inside an LHI interview because they generally have the video um, in a context page. So okay. the interview is one of the multiple things that are there to support the pro bono lawyer, the lawyer, or the SRL person. So the video is watched before they come into the interview or from the printed instructions. They can get instructions to go watch the video on what to do next. So the video, and it's expensive and all that. The audio is annoying to the frequent flyers. Mm -hmm. So for people who are in like a, a place where there's like a, a group, a big group processing going on, etc., and the audio clicks in, it gets really annoying turning it off and stuff like that. And then there's the expenses that Dina talked about. You know, if you change the interview, do you have to change the narration? There's no resources to record or very little how to record, setting up a sound recording studio and all of that. Mm -hmm. So for people, the audio has sustainability issues. And then depending on the location, it's difficult uh, to be turning it off and on or causing annoyance if it's a bank of computers. Right. That makes sense without having people having headphones. You know, even just thinking about yeah. our self web center, self help web center, we have three computers there. and. It's already on the floor with the clerk's office. It would be out of control if we didn't have headphones, if, you know, if we used audio without headphones. So, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, Carolyn, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Carolyn? Oh, okay. Um, Okay, sorry, I did the same thing. I had myself <laughs> muted. Okay. I just, I just locked my husband out of the house, so <laughs> go rescue him. Um, I think with the audio, my problem with the audio, I think audio is really, really important from an accessibility point of view, but at the same time, um, I'm concerned because you can't do audio with the variables, you know, where you pick, you can't, your audio can't mimic your text because of those, the macros, right? So right. if you're being really friendly, you can't say, oh, Caroline, oh, Jessica, you know, Claudia, you know, I know this is difficult for you to tell me about, bloody blah, blah. So, so the, this, there's a drawback there. Um, and, and, then, and then with the videos, I think as long as you're not having this problem with Internet Explorer, it's just as, it's probably better to link to a website where you can see the videos. Right. And then um, the final thing, what I just typed it in here. Let's see what I said. Oh, yeah. And the other thing is I think the way technology is going, it probably won't be too long before people are going to have, you know, people who really need audio have screen readers. Right. If you're doing this in HTML5 now, I would think that a screen reader obviously can't do it in Flash, but we're evolving, right? So if you really need a screen reader and you're using 
the internet or your mobile phones and stuff, I would assume that people would have screen readers that would do this for them. And it, that would solve the, that problem. And we, we do use images more and more. I'm using images because to show people. I think those are really helpful. Yeah. But the video and the audio, I would, you know, third that those aren't as useful with embedded in the in the interview. Yeah, we're seeing images like ev almost every you know A to J or every program has images in it. But it, and the audio, it seems like if your program does it, you do audio a lot. And then if you don't do audio a lot, you kind of don't do it at all. And the same with video. So it's images is kind of across the board, but those two, the audio and video, are kind of um, outliers. So um, Jeff talked about potentially embedding a YouTube video in it. So Jeff, I'll unmute you if you want to expand a little bit on that. It's kind of an interesting um, idea. I'm just saying if, you, if it was something that had to go by the wayside for lack of use, I would, I'd, I'd still like the ability to maybe embed a YouTube video or have a YouTube video. I, on the mobile experience, it would be cool if it sort of layer over, play, and then slide, in, slide away. So like on an extended learn more, like what is a... What is a foreclosure? I, I could imagine doing like a three minute or two minute piece of video. And that would get get you'd get rid of all of your size issues, right? It's hosted mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, and it also gets rid of that if because in mobile, you know, most people have those little iPod earbuds, some kind of thing, you know, with them. Um, you know, it's personalized, you're not invading kind of everyone's space if you're watching a video. Um, so that kind of does mobile actually as a help there too as well. Um, for audio or video. So I like that idea. Okay, so I'm actually going to move on because we're, we're running a little long here on time because of awesome comments. So if you want to bring it up at the end about audio video, you know, let me know. The next one, foreign languages. So I actually have a screenshot of a uh, Chinese, um, A to J, and also one that allows you to do um, English and then in the Learn More, um, or in the pop-up, they have Spanish and French options as well. So what do you think about the um, foreign languages? Are you all planning more foreign language A to J's? And if you are, are you actually creating them in the foreign language, or are you running them more side-by-side -side with the English one? So any... Oops. Tony, go ahead. You're unmuted. And this is actually... Tony's A to J on the left here. Yeah, so for our purposes, um, we're um, definitely going to continue to maintain foreign language interviews, and we would like to expand. Um, and I think, um, and I think it's really important to make sure that you know that there's support for that moving forward. Particularly, you know, making sure that the non-Roman character language implementation is pretty robust because we. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the, the Cali team is well aware yes. of the challenges we've had with trying to um, implement um, Chinese and Vietnamese in particular. Um, although I, I guess in the new version, if it's HTML5, all of that may be resolved. But um, definitely multilingual uh, interviews are, are going to be a critical part of, of our use of A to J. And, um, and we develop them. Um, side by side with an English version. So there's, we always start with an English version and then, um, and then get that translated. So you just kind of basically overlay the the foreign language onto an A to J that you already have, or that you create. You start. You said you start with the English first. Yeah, yeah, and then okay. um, and then we basically, you know, um, create new versions with the other language, but with, with all of the same logic. That's interesting. Yeah, I think these are. Um, Amazing, especially the Chinese one. When I saw it, I was like, "That is the coolest thing <laughs> I've seen lately." Um, it's and we're we have actually some interest from around around the world on using A to J's, and we're working to expand our um, foreign language capabilities. It's actually one of our um, projects for A to J five is to really make sure that that it, it's easier to make foreign language um, and use non Arabic characters like Chinese characters, that kind of thing. Um, Mike, go ahead. You're unmuted. Yeah, I just wanted to say we're, we're just getting started with foreign language interviews, um, but I mean our plan is to, uh, you know, we already have English versions of the interviews, and I think our approach is going to be to give people the option at the outset, you know, for which language they they want to use. Much like if you call, 
you know, a helpline and they ask you press to one. Press, yeah. Press, yeah, exactly. It'll be the same sort of approach rather than having, you know, the English on one side and the Spanish on the other. Um, and, and I think it'll, it'll probably look better and feel a little bit more familiar uh, to foreign language speakers if we do it that way. So, so do you um, do you guys have help desks that these run at, or you're mostly just run from your legal aid website? Uh, you mean our interviews? Yes. They, yeah, they're primarily being run from Law Help. Um, I mean, we have a, a resource, landlord tenant resource center where they've been using our uh, our housing forms. And we're actually starting with an informal papyrus application mm -hmm. of our first Spanish interview, which is actually applicable in housing as well as family and civil and small claims. So it'll be broadly available to a lot of different users. Okay, because you mentioned just doing it in all in one language. So we have our help desk here at the Daily Center um, that uses a lot of the ALEO forms, Only Legal Aid Online. Um, but so we have a student that's sitting there, a law student sitting there next to the end user, and I've, at least I've heard that it's easier if we have the Spanish on one side or whatever the foreign languages and the English on the other so that the, the help at the help desk can actually work, you know, one-to-one -one and they can both kind of see what's going on. But I definitely see how we can. Okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because I hadn't considered that as an issue. Yeah, um, it's... I mean, because I'm, I'm in the law help mindset rather than yeah. the help desk mindset. Yeah, it's interesting because some of our volunteers, they see the same kind of issues over and over. Um, you know, they've been there for two years. They could go through any form, whatever the language is, and they kind of know know what it says, but, you know, where to click, that kind of thing. But it helps um, kind of explain maybe someone who, has a who knows a little bit of English and one of our volunteers knows a little bit of Spanish. If they have them side by side, they can kind of work their way through it. But. Okay, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate yeah. it. No problem. So, okay, Claudia, I'm going to unmute you now, and I'm also unmuting Dina. So you both are up. Make sure to unmute yourselves. Okay, Dina, okay. do you want to go? <laughs> um, so on the side-by-side, -side, I really think that that's a best practice. The thing here is that the side-by-side -side is being used by using the pop-up button. So it takes away the ability to attach other things. But, um, you know, that is a very effective way to work um, in a multilingual environment with mm -hmm. always having a target language and then the main language, which would, always, which, um, which would always be English. There are some populations that have bridge languages. So the, the bridge language could be uh, like Vietnam, like um, Mandarin could be a bridge language because there's a lot of other communities that speak Mandarin as an intermediate to English. Uh, Spanish is a bridge language for some of the Mixteco and some of the Mayan languages coming from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the anchor language is not always going to be English. It could be right. a tip of French, um, French, like in this case for this New York interview. But I think the side-by-side -side is really helpful. We are doing in hot dogs. Um, some programs where the question is presented in both languages. Okay, and the answer just um, pops up in, would pop up in, in, in English? The, yeah, the, yeah, but the question itself, um, you know, is in English and then plain language, target language. Mm -hmm. um, with the idea is that a lot of people that speak a second language are super confident, overconfident at times, mm -hmm. and because we're in a very specific legal domain, if you can suggest the correct terminology, it's less likely that the question will be misinterpreted. So the idea of having the two languages together is to help the staff person that may not be fully bilingual or may not understand the target language legal domain mm -hmm. intricacies, you can build that in through the interview. Okay, that's interesting. I'm also um, wondering about what the language is, if you do have it in a foreign language. Um, and they're filling out a court form, and the reply has to be in English. If having kind of primarily or completely in the foreign language would create problems down the road for how the answers Well, come. English is still, this is still an English-only country. So um, unless there are states that have allowed, like in Puerto Rico, you can, um, but actually in federal court, you still file in English, and in, mm -hmm. in, you're filing in Boston if you're practicing federal law. So it's all, the form always prints in English. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is that you can make any instructions or anything that is not 
required but just helpful or, or, or instructions, process, charts, things like that. You can print that in the target language. And then in New York, actually, they do print a translation of the order in Spanish, but it's right. marked not for official use. Right, but I'm thinking of like a text box area where it'd be like, you know, explain no, why you want, you know, this order of protection or what's your cause of action, you know, those little text boxes. Oh, yeah, open text is not, it's, um, it's not there yet. Machine translation is not there yet. Yeah, okay, so I see a couple more hands. Carolyn, go ahead, you're unmuted. I'm also unmuting Tony, so both of you are open now. Tony and Carol. Did, what, did, wasn't Dana going to say something after uh, Claudia, or did she talk and I missed? I wasn't paying attention. No, she's open, but I don't, I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just waiting what? for, can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Dana. Yeah. Okay, so a couple things that, with this, I, for um, what we're doing with development for the next two to three years, we'll be doing everything in at least English and Spanish as probably as well as in Polish. Um, I think usability-wise, I agree with Claudia that the side-by-side, -side, um, especially for a self-help center, which we have lots of in Illinois, um, for to have assisted help at these help centers is very like user-friendly um, and beneficial. And also for maintenance. So if you have a lot of interviews with the programs that you work with, and if you do one update in the English version, then you have to remember to do the exact same update in the Spanish version or the French or the Polish or whatever. So for me, maintenance why is I think having all the languages in one interview is beneficial? I can make the exact same changes, you know, within the same screen. Um, but my question to you, Jessica, is you just um, were mentioning with mobile mm -hmm. that pop-ups and learn mores are going to become a problem. Yes. Not a problem, but something that you're working through. Yes. Um, so now we have an entire Spanish site, and we like to promote the Spanish interviews that we do have. So if we have the mobile issue and I'm putting all of my Spanish in a pop-up, how is a Spanish user going to easily get through that interview on a mobile device? Well, that's kind of where we wanted to talk to you guys today. We haven't, nothing is nailed down, nothing is, you know, 100%, and that's that's one of the issues that how, um, like just looking at the screen here, you know, you can have side by side, it's super easy to see both. It is on that mobile that it has to kind of take over the screen, so it wouldn't be able to do a side by side, and maybe that's where um, primarily all in one language interviews would be better. Um, or you could have it, um, for example, this Spanish and French one in front of us. Um, you know, you'd have it at the top if you want to see it in Espanol. Click here, and it would pop up in Spanish that screen. Um, right, but then the user has to pop that up every time, and then also yeah. figure out how to navigate back. So maybe it's something, yeah, maybe it's something that we, instead of, um, like, in, from the outset, maybe they can decide what language it is. That's why I think that, that would be super beneficial. If there was a way, like, the way that we put the text into A to J author in the learn more area, mm -hmm. if we could just put the alternative foreign language, and then at the beginning, the user can say that they only want to see it in Spanish, and mm -hmm. then it would only show the entire program in Spanish. So... When, when we're creating the A to J's, we just have another box, foreign language, and we can select whatever that foreign language is and put it there, as, and then have, you know, the English in there. I can put Spanish and Polish and English all into one, and at the beginning, the user could just check which language they would like, and then the whole interview would proceed in that language. Yeah, you know, just would branch. Be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I'll bring that up to John to see about a potential branching in the beginning or an advanced... Well, not necessarily branching, because... Branching would mean that I would have to build a question in each language. Mm -hmm. I want to have one question where all three languages live, and when the user selects one language, they just proceed through the interview only in that language. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes okay. sense. But they, you, yeah, instead of each question picking whether you want English, Spanish, or French right. in the beginning. And this is, I mean, again, it's for maintenance. So just because we have so many interviews in Illinois um, and like everyone else, I'm sure here, we all work on very small budgets. Um, so maintenance-wise, having all of the languages for me in one question when I do maintenance or changes is oh, really wow. beneficial. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll pop that out to John, see, see what he says, see what, what the options are. No problem. Okay, so I am going to move on here because I have a couple more screens. I'm muting you all again, um, so just be sure to raise your hand. 
And um, I'm going to skip the next one, actually, and go on to what I think might be a little um, controversial or what we could talk about a lot um, for our last couple minutes here is our A to J avatar. So I have the options here. We have our tan or our blank um, skin tones. And you, as the end user, can get a female or a male um, as representative of themselves, the avatar. But should we offer a variety um, of avatars so that the author themselves could choose what, um, not just what skin tone, and potentially we add other skin tones here, um, but maybe uh, whether it's a man as the as the guide or um, certain aspects of that. So what are your thoughts on changing the avatar? Make sure to raise your hand. Um, okay, Jeff, I see you put a question in. Go ahead, you're, un oh, you're unmuted. I'm really often not the person to think that we should be so sensitive to these issues that we um, you know, uh, over over litigated in our minds, but I mean, I I, I'm, I think every time I click on the gender button, I think of uh, a transgender person. Right. I know, and I think, why, why we don't we don't really need gender. It's really only so this avatar looks like we think a girl should look, which is apparently with long hair, right? And how a boy should look, which is short hair, and I can't be. I mean, I am a feminist, but I'm definitely third wave. I'm you can be whatever you want to be. <laughs> But this, I really would, I know people are kind of joking about it, but I, I really would like at least someone to think about whether you could have a non-gendered avatar. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a um, kind of a designer on that we're working with to kind of update A to J. This avatar is old, um, just graphically wise. So that may be an issue we can throw to the designer and say, you know, what what do you think would work? or. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm we, sure they can come up with something. Plus, you know, we so, try so hard to economize on questions. Every time I hit that question, I think, I don't need it. I don't want it. Um, I'd prefer that it wasn't there. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing that Mike mentioned that they decided a long time ago not to even use the avatar. and so that They don't even ask the gender question. So the end user for their interviews doesn't even get um, the option, basically, to have, have a avatar for themselves. So that's that's an interesting one. If you're finding maybe your community um, reacting poorly to having to choose whether it's male or female. Um, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I've never thought of that. Like, uh, I'm going to uh, go back to bed. <laughs> well, that's why we're here. We like to, you know, share things. I can't believe I never thought to just not ask the question. Yeah. Oh, Lord, well, it comes standard in the package. So we, we like our avatar. I mean, we like the idea of an avatar, but we're, we obviously recognize that. Um, it, it needs some updating. It's very 2000-ish, um, and we're looking for, you know, 2012 and beyond. So um, would you guys, so a lot of the things we get, I'm just going to mute you again, Jeff. Um, a lot of the things we get are, um, I wish I had a male avatar because I only have a man in the office that can do the recordings. Or, um, you know, I, I want to give my end user the, or I wouldn't give the end user experience of having a man as a guide pros, cons for that one, if you guys, um, would you use maybe audio more if you had a man? So, Carolyn, you're unmuted. Um, we t I talked about this at a TIG conference a couple of years ago, and Claudia mm -hmm. cited some information saying that people tend to trust a woman. Right. And, I mean, Jeff, you're talking about overthinking and over litigating and stuff. I mean, do we know how people feel about whether they have, whether they're represented by a male or a female avatar or a male or, I mean, with, yeah, or whether the, and, you know, our little hostess avatar is male or female? Because I, I really think this is something that could be tested and should be tested rather than we developers, unless we, unless we see problems or people hesitating or uncomfortable with it, I think we ought to test this and find out about it rather than trying to accommodate something that may not be a problem. Right. Well, that's interesting, something to think about. Yeah, we're, we're asking you guys rather than asking maybe the end users that we should be asking. This would be something we could think about in the future, kind of researching. Um, and we, we actually did have the idea of potentially letting the end user, or not the end user, I'm sorry, the um, the author select which 
avatar they would like to use. Um, give them, you know, five options of an avatar that you'd like to use. Just like we allow you to select blank or tan skin color, um, that might be an option for the future. So we're going to throw this out to our designer and see, see what he can come up with. But if you guys have ideas for potentially how we could do a gender neutral, um, we're, we're trying to avoid like the paperclip guy or a teddy bear, that kind of thing has been suggested in the past. But, um, you know, shoot us ideas if you guys have um, ones like that and have ideas. So, Jeff, you're unmuted again. I just want to say that um, I think finding out what end users think is good, but this is one of those where it's not a majority rules. Right. If you have 90, 93% say they don't care and 7% find it really offensive, I think it's worth it's worth considering a, a, an option, that's all. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. All right, Tony, you're unmuted. Hi, uh, so this is Tony. I just wanted to say two things. One is that when we were showing Citizenship Works to a group of local funders in New York, we had a transgender program officer from the foundation express his uh, concern that we were using software that used uh, gender normative imagery and didn't allow for users to pick their own avatar. So that kind of leads into my second point, which is, uh, is there was there any consideration of creating maybe like a set of uh, maybe six, six to eight, um, you know, standard avatars that people could pick whichever one they wanted to represent them through the course of the interview. Yeah, we, we actually are talking about um, giving the end user more options too. So we're just trying to maybe conceptualize the idea of what the avatar would even look like. So um, it we'd like to stick to, you know, humans, not um, other like paper clips or teddy bears or stick figures, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's one of the issues we pose to our designer about give us give us some options that we could give our end users and our authors for both the guide and the end user avatar. So, it's something out there, we're thinking about it. So, Mike, go ahead, you're unmuted. Just a quick comment, I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, we have the ability to upload uh, organizational logos and such mm -hmm. uh, and pictures at the end of the interview. I just wonder if this is another place to give authors more control, especially since it sounds like in a lot of ways this is a local issue. Um, you know, we want to serve our populations in our locales as best we can, and, you know, if authors in particular locales have different preferences based on their user population, you know, maybe we, we can create a situation where we can all upload our own graphics. And um, obviously, you still have a, a set to offer us that's built into the system, but also give us the option to choose something else. That's interesting. We've talked about that a little bit in our, on our A to J meetings. And our concern is always that, obviously, we don't think you guys here are going to upload anything you know, inappropriate. But we'd hate you know, our guide avatar to be wearing a super short skirt or to be used inappropriately. Or you know, Those are our only concerns with kind of the, the uploading the own image end. So it's, we're, we're talking about it, though. So it's out there. We're thinking about it. Um, and we just wanted to let you guys know that we we have heard you, and we understand that there are um, sensitive issues that we need to think about. So um, and I think if, if anyone did anything like that, they wouldn't be developing HJ interviews for very long. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we don't want our A to J avatar to be um, inappropriate for the situation. So yeah, we, we're not fearing that you guys are doing it, but you know we have this this tool out there, so we want to protect the integrity of our our system. So I know that we're um, we're at the hour. So if anyone wants to stick around, I'm going to run for maybe five more minutes, ten more minutes. We'll get um, get some more talking about this. We have some good conversation. But if you have to leave, we understand. Um, the next issue is the courthouse. So this is a contentious issue. Um, not obviously the road to the courthouse. Um, you can change whether it's a courthouse or a sign, that kind of thing. The end graphic is changeable. But what if it looked different? Does it have to be a road? Could it branch out and the, the end user would walk up and there would be a fork in the road? And they could go one way or they could go the other way, particularly thinking about maybe triage. So not all clients who come to the A to J's and who do triage um, through you know, online intake 
not all of them are going to end up in the same place. Either they're going to go, you know, get kicked out and suggest go to a lawyer. They're going to be sent to the public defenders. They're going to be sent to the legal aid um, society. So what if it looked different? Um, what if it was more of like a loading and it told you what percentage of the interview you were done with? That kind of thing. So, Claudia, you're unmuted. Yeah, on the I was just gonna say on the on the fo on phone technology, all of the big corporate phone systems use female voices mm -hmm. because they have been found to be more comforting, etc. Now, mind you, that the IVR technology was developed like commercialized in the 70s, so there could be gender implicit bias assumptions about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if 20, 2010 a gender voice would be more comforting than a female voice. Mm -hmm. And so just commenting on that, what Carolyn said, we had talked about EJC. On the on the road to the courthouse, um, there are other tools that people are using, like Prezi, um, and other tools that people are using to orient people on the process of a case. Mm -hmm. um, don't know how much the legal aid community is using those tools. Maybe some of them are starting to use them in the self-help world. So just to keep the issue of timing is that people are coming in to get something done, print it, e-file it, and move on. So if there's a lot of roads um, on, you know, different roads that they can go and explore, mm -hmm. that's all going to get to the usability of the whole thing and then the length right. of the interview piece, which right. is always of concern because we do impose, we, LHI, does impose a two-hour limit of inactivity on any session. Um, but then if people are in public terminals, like in courts or libraries, sometimes they even have shorter computer time limits for security reasons in right. public terminals. But um, so the question is, is the road shown in the interview as a last catch-up or should it be shown in the context in which this tool is presented right. through another tool like a Prezi or through a flowchart or through an, an outline or a diagram. Yeah, and we've, this is another issue that arose with mobile. Um, you know, when we first started A to J, we had a, had studies and, you know, we wanted a lot of white space and we wanted to make it easy for the end user to see where they're going. But on mobile, this takes up real estate. Um, so there's been discussion about maybe kind of like a subway map at the top um, to show what progress they are, um, how far into it. We're, we're talking about different options for um, progress bars. But the, the progress bar is an issue because not every interview runs the same way. You know, if you, if you have seven children, it obviously takes you longer to get through a repeat loop. Um, and and maybe an answer to one question determines how long later on it'll take you. So we are thinking also about the the progress bar and that issue. So Mike, you're unmuted. I, I was really just going to reiterate that point about the difference in interview paths um, because I, I have had several people ask, you know, why can't we tell users how far along they are and mm -hmm. how much time they have left, but. Uh, it, it might just be impracticable because of all the differences that people are going to run into. Um, I, I mean, I generally like this design. Uh, I mean, not everybody ends up at the courthouse, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it at least gives you a simple visual depiction of how many steps you have to go. Right. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm just being conservative, but I kind of like the way it's currently set up. Right. Well, we, I mean, we're talking about it. Again, no plans to change anything. We just want input. So we like to hear that people like it <laughs> as it is. So that's good. Okay. Um, I'm going to check for hands real quick. And then one more issue, whether or not different interviews should look different based on what type of interview it is, basically. So should triage interviews look different than your basic doc assembly or informational A to J? Should e-filing look different? Um, just options that we're thinking of. For those of you maybe that use online intake, triage, um, and also maybe have doc assembly or e-filing, any thoughts on that? Now we're kind of taking a lot of your time today, so understand. Okay, Dino is asking, what does it mean to look different? So um, Ron actually brought it up in the last couple of days of what if um, the, you know, when you do an online intake, it 
has one, one way of structuring the A to J, the graphical interface. So maybe it doesn't, you don't have the path to a courthouse, you have a progress bar, um, and maybe informational or document assembly A to Js look the way they look now. Um, maybe e-filing looks different. So the interviews themselves would, um, would graphically be different or organizationally be different. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so we are having some thoughts that it should be pretty much the same so that they're constantly recognizable. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, um, any thoughts on this one? Just raise your hand. If not, just let you know we're thinking about it. Um, again, can someone's mic said consistency is good. Okay, so that's good feedback from you guys. Um, we really appreciate you all showing up today and contributing. It really helps us on the A to J side kind of figure out where we are in the community and what you guys are thinking about. And um, we, we love, you know, hearing from you guys. So thank you very much. If you have any other questions, last minute comments that you want to do, throw your hand up. Go ahead, Mike. This is something I've wanted for a long time, and I, I constantly shoot myself in the foot because I don't have an undo uh, capability. Uh, I delete text when I didn't mean to, okay. I delete a question when I didn't mean to, and I'm kind of screwed because I can't <laughs> go back. Yes, no, I, I'm there with you. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's something we can definitely think about. Um, I, I can see the, the help with that I'm constantly using that button on, on Word, so I'm right there with you. Okay, thank you. No problem, thanks. Okay, so um, any other questions, just throw your hand up. Last call. All right, I'm not seeing any, so if you do have any other suggestions, always feel free to throw them my way. We're constantly um, thinking of ways to update A to J, so we'd love to hear from you. If you hit on anything, let me know. Um, just our new user training is November 1st and December 6th for the rest of this year, and our next advanced user training is December 20th. Um, and for any of you, um, we are going to be at the TIG conference doing a pre-conference training. So Claudia and uh, LHI sent out a notice about that yesterday. So make sure to sign up if you want to come to the A to J and Hot Docs training. And a big thanks to Kelly for letting us use our GoTo meeting services. And a big thanks to all of you. So this has been great. Thank you.